Well, thank you very much, and thank you all for uh, coming. My idea is to read for about 20 or 22 minutes or so, and then uh, take any questions you have. So, uh, I often get asked why I wrote such a book, and I start off explaining why. Every week I receive two or three emails asking me whether Jesus existed as a human being. When I started getting these emails some years ago now, I thought the question was rather peculiar, and I did not take it seriously. Of course Jesus existed. Everyone knows he existed, don't they? But the questions kept coming, and soon I began to wonder, why are so many people asking? My wonder only increased when I learned that I myself was being quoted in some circles, misquoted rather, as saying that Jesus never existed. I decided to look into the matter. I discovered to my surprise an entire body of literature devoted to the question of whether or not there was a real man Jesus. I was surprised because I'm trained as a scholar of the New Testament and early Christianity, and for 30 years I have written extensively on the historical Jesus, the Gospels, the early Christian movement, and the history of the Church's first 300 years. Like all New Testament scholars, I've read thousands of books and articles in English and other European languages on Jesus, the New Testament, and early Christianity. But I was almost completely unaware, as are most of my colleagues in the field, of this body of skeptical literature. These sundry books and articles, not to mention websites, are of varying quality. Some of them rival the Da Vinci Code in their passion for conspiracy and the shallowness of their historical knowledge, not just of the New Testament and early Christianity, but of ancient religions generally, and even more broadly, the ancient world. But a couple of bona fide scholars, not professors teaching religious studies in universities, but scholars nonetheless, and at least one of them with a PhD in the field of the New Testament, have taken this position and written about it. Their books may not be known to most of the general public interested in questions related to Jesus, the Gospels, or the early Christian church, but they do occupy a noteworthy niche as a small but loud minority voice. Once you tune into this voice, you quickly learn just how persistent and vociferous it can be. And the voice is being heard loud and clear in some places. Even a quick internet search reveals how influential such radical skepticism has been in the past and how rapidly it is spreading even now. For decades, it was the dominant view in countries such as the Soviet Union. Yet more striking, it appears to be the majority view in some regions of the West today, including some parts of Scandinavia. The authors of this skeptical literature understand themselves to be mythicists. That is, those who believe that Jesus is a myth. When mythicists use the term myth, they often seem to mean simply a story that has no historical basis, a history-like narrative that in fact did not happen. In this sense, Jesus is a myth because even though there are plenty of ancient stories about him, they're not historical. His life and teachings were invented by early storytellers. He never really lived. Those who do not think Jesus existed are frequently militant in their views and remarkably adept at countering evidence that to the rest of the civilized world seems compelling and even unanswerable. But these, these writers have answers, and the smart ones among them need to be taken seriously, if for no other reason than to show why they cannot be right about their major contention. The reality is that whatever else you may think about Jesus, he certainly exist, did exist. That is what this book will set out to demonstrate. It's striking that virtually everyone who has spent all the years needed to attain the necessary qualifications is convinced that Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical figure. This is not a piece of evidence, but if nothing else, it should give one pause. In the field of biology, evolution may be just a theory, as some politicians painfully point out, but it is the theory subscribed to, for good reason, by every real scientist in every established university in the Western world. Still, as is clear from the avalanche of sometimes outraged postings on all the relevant internet sites, there's simply no way to convince conspiracy theorists that the evidence for their position is too thin to be convincing, and that the evidence for a traditional view is thoroughly persuasive. Anyone who chooses to believe something contrary to evidence that an overwhelming majority of people find overwhelmingly convincing 
whether it involves the fact of the Holocaust, the landing on the moon, the assassination of presidents, or even a presidential place of birth, will not be convinced. Simply will not be convinced. And so, with this book, I do not expect to convince anyone in that boat. What I do hope is to convince genuine seekers who really want to know how we know that Jesus did exist as virtually every scholar of antiquity, of biblical studies, of classics, and of Christian origins in the country, and in fact, in the Western world agrees. Many of these scholars have no vested interest in the matter. As it turns out, I myself do not either. I'm not a Christian, and I have no interest in promoting a Christian cause or a Christian agenda. I'm an agnostic, with atheist leanings, and my life and views of the world would be approximately the same whether or not Jesus existed. My beliefs would vary little. The answer to the question of Jesus' historical existence will not make me more or less happy, content, hopeful, likable, rich, famous, or immortal. But, as a historian, I think evidence matters, and the past matters. And for anyone to whom both evidence and the past matter, a dispassionate consideration of the case makes it quite plain. Jesus did exist. He may not have been the Jesus that your mother believes in, or the Jesus of the stained glass window, or the Jesus of your least favorite televangelist, or the Jesus proclaimed by the Vatican, the Southern Baptist Convention, the local megachurch, or the California Gnostic. But he did exist, and we can say a few things with relative certainty about him. Now I skip over from the introduction to, uh, to read a couple pages on what, uh, what mythicists typically say. The case that most mythicists have made against the historical existence of Jesus involves both negative and positive arguments, with far more of the former. On the negative side, mythicists typically stress that there are no reliable references to the existence of Jesus in any non-Christian sources of the first century. Jesus allegedly lived until about the year 30 CE. But no Greek or Roman author, or any other non-Christian author for that matter, mentions him for over 80 years after that. If Jesus was such an important figure, or even if he wasn't so important, wouldn't there be a reference to him in some of our many surviving sources from the first century? We have the writings of historians, politicians, philosophers, religion scholars, poets, and scientists. We have inscriptions placed on buildings and personal letters written by average people. In none of these non-Christian writings of the first century is Jesus ever mentioned, not even once. It is typically argued by those who hold to Jesus' historical existence that he is in fact mentioned by one author, uh, this is the counter to the mythicists, that he's mentioned by the Jewish historian Josephus, who wrote a number of surviving books near the end of the first century. Mythicists, however, claim that the two references to Jesus in Josephus' book, Jewish Antiquities, uh, these are the only two references of Jesus in all of Josephus' abundant writings, that these two references were not written originally by Josephus, but were inserted into his writings by later Christian scribes. If these mythicists are right, this would mean that we don't have a single reference to Jesus in non-Christian texts, before the writings of Pliny, a Roman governor of a province in what is now Turkey, in uh, 112 CE, and in the writings of Roman historians uh, Tacitus and Suetonius a few years later. Some mythicists claim that these references, too, were inserted into these writings, that they are not original. We'll be looking at all these references soon. For now, it's enough to note that mythicists argue that it is hard to believe that Jesus would not be talked about argued with, commented on, or even mentioned by writers of his own day or in the decades afterward if he really existed. In addition, they typically claim that the historical Jesus does not appear prominently even in early Christian writings apart from the New Testament Gospels. In particular, they maintain that the Apostle Paul, who wrote more books of the New Testament than anyone else, says hardly anything about the historical Jesus, or that he says nothing at all. This may come as a shock to most readers of the New Testament, but a careful reading of Paul's letters shows the problems. Paul has a lot to say about Jesus' death and resurrection, especially the resurrection, and he clearly worships him as his Lord. 
but he says very little indeed about anything that Jesus said and did while he was alive. Why would that be if Jesus was in fact a historical person? Why doesn't Paul quote the words of Jesus, such as the Sermon on the Mount? Why does he never refer to any of Jesus' parables? Why doesn't he indicate what Jesus did? Why not mention any of his miracles, his exorcism, his controversy, his trip to Jerusalem, his trial before Pontius Pilate, and so on? What this means is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are our only real sources for knowing about the historical Jesus, and mythicists find these four sources highly problematic as historical, as historical documents. For one thing, they were written near the end of the first century at best, four or five decades or more after Jesus allegedly lived. If he really did live, wouldn't we have some earlier sources? And how can we rely on such hearsay from so many years later? Moreover, Mythicists typically point out that the Gospels cannot be trusted in what they do say. There are many accounts of what Jesus said and did are chock full of contradictions and discrepancies, and so are completely unreliable. The Gospels are thoroughly biased toward their subject matter, and so do not present anything like disinterested history as it really was. They can be shown to have modified the stories they relate, and in some places, they obviously have made up stories about Jesus. In fact, virtually all, or even all, of the stories may have been invented. This is especially the case with the so-called miracles of Jesus, narrated by the Gospel writers to convince others to believe in Him, but incredible to the point that, well, they are literally incredible, not to be believed. Okay, now, I'm summarizing the mythicist position here. Furthermore, many mythicists insist that the four Gospels ultimately go back to just one of the Gospels, Mark, on which the other three were based. This means that of all the many writers, pagan, Jewish, and Christian, that we have from the first century, assuming that Mark was written as early as the first century, we have only one that describes or even mentions the life of the historical Jesus. How plausible is that if Jesus actually lived? Given all these problems, some mythicists insist that the burden of proof rests on anyone who wants to claim that Jesus did, in fact, exist. Added to these negative arguments is one very important positive one, that the stories about Jesus, many of them incredible, all of them based on late and unreliable witnesses, are paralleled time and again in the myths about pagan gods and other divine men discussed in the ancient world. And so, mythicists typically appeal to accounts of other gods or demigods, such as Heracles, Osiris, Mithras, Attis, uh, Adonis, and uh, Dionysus, who were, uh, sorry, who were said to have been born on December 25th to a virgin mother, to have done miraculous deeds for the sake of others, to have died often for the sake of others, and to have been raised from the dead and later departed to live in the divine realm. I've already said a few words about such claims, and we'll examine them in greater detail at a later point, for now it's enough to stress that mythicists make a two-pronged argument. Given the negative argument that we have no reliable witness that even mentions a historical Jesus, and the positive one that his story appears to have been modeled on the accounts told of other divinities, it is simplest to believe that he never existed, but was invented as another supernatural being. In this reading of the evidence, Christianity is founded on a myth. Okay, so after laying out the mythicist position, um, I start talking about what evidence there is uh, for there being a historical Jesus. Uh, and I, uh, I actually I begin by talking about what we don't have as evidence. Uh, some stuff that you might think we would have, we don't have. So, what we don't have. It may be useful uh, to start by considering what we do not have by way of historical records for Jesus to set the stage for a more detailed consideration in the next chapter of what we do have. So first, physical evidence. To begin with, there is no hard physical evidence for Jesus, uh, 1800 years before photography was invented, including no archaeological evidence of any kind. This is not much of an argument against Jesus' existence, however, 
since there's no archaeological evidence for anyone else living in Palestine in Jesus' day, except for the very upper-crust elite aristocrats who are occasionally mentioned in inscriptions. Uh, we have no other archaeological evidence even for any of these persons. In fact, we don't have archaeological remains for any non-aristocratic Jew of the 20s CE when Jesus would have been an adult. And absolutely no one thinks that Jesus was an upper-class upper aristocrat. So why would we have archaeological evidence of his existence? We also do not have any writings from Jesus. To many people this may seem odd, but in fact it's not odd at all. The vast majority of people in the ancient world could not write, as we'll see in greater detail. There are debates about Jesus' literacy, if of course he lived, but even if he could read, there are no indications from our early sources that he could write, and there's no reference to any of his writings in any of our Gospels. So there's nothing strange about having nothing, written, nothing in writing from him. I should point out that we have nothing in writing from over 99.99% .99 of people who lived in antiquity. That doesn't mean, of course, that they didn't live. It means that if we want to show that any of them lived, we have to look for other kinds of evidence. Next, non-Christian sources. It's also true, as the mythicists have been quick to point out, and as I've already read, that no Greek or Roman author from the first century mentions Jesus. It would be very convenient for us if they did, but alas, they do not. At the same time, the fact is again a bit ir irrelevant, since these same sources do not mention many millions of people who actually did live. Jesus stands here with the vast majority of living, breathing human beings of earlier ages. Moreover, it is an error to argue, as, it's sometimes, uh, as is sometimes done by one mythicist or another, that anyone as spectacular as Jesus allegedly was, who did so many miracles and fantastic deeds, would certainly have been discussed, or at least mentioned, in pagan sources if he really did exist. Surely anyone who could heal the sick cast out demons, walk on water, feed the multitudes with only a few loaves, and raise the dead would be talked about. The reason this line of reasoning is in error is that we are not asking whether Jesus really did miracles, and if so, why they and he are not mentioned by pagan sources. We are asking whether Jesus of Nazareth actually existed. Only after establishing that he did exist can we go on to ask if he did miracles. If we decide that he did, only then can we revisit the question of why no one in that case mentions him. But we may also decide that the historical Jesus was not a miraculous being, but a purely human being. In that case, it's no surprise that Roman sources never mention him, just as, it, just as it is no surprise that these same sources never mention any of his uncles, aunts, cousins, nieces, or nephews, or in fact, nearly any other Jew of his day. In that connection, I should reiterate that it is a complete myth, in the mythicist sense, that Romans kept detailed records of everything, and that as a result, we are inordinately well informed about the world of Roman Palestine, and should expect them to hear about Jesus if he really lived. If Romans kept such records, where are they? We certainly don't have any. Think of everything we do not know about the reign of Pontius Pilate as governor of Judea. We know from the Jewish historian Josephus that Pilate ruled for 10 years between 26 and 36 CE. It would be easy to argue that he was the single most important figure for Roman Palestine for the entire length of his rule. And what records from this decade do we have from his reign? What Roman records of his major accomplishments, his daily itinerary, the decrees he passed, the laws he issued, the prisoners he put on trial, the death warrants he signed, his scandals, his interviews, his judicial proceedings? We have none. Nothing at all. I might press the issue further. What archaeological evidence do we have about Pilate's rule in Palestine? We have some coins that were issued during his reign. One would not expect coins about Jesus, since he didn't issue any. And we have one, only one, fragmentary inscription discovered in Caesarea Maritima in 1961 that indicates that Pilate was the Roman prefect. Nothing else. And what writings do we have from him? Not a single word. Does that mean he didn't exist? No, 
He's mentioned in several passages in Josephus and in the writings of the Alexandrian Jewish philosopher Philo and in the Gospels. He certainly existed, even though, like Jesus, we have no records from his day or writings from his hand. And what is striking is that we have far more information about Pilate than about any other governor of Judea in Roman times. And so it's a modern myth to say that we have extensive Roman records from antiquity that surely would have mentioned someone like Jesus had he existed. It's also worth pointing out that Pilate is mentioned only in passing in the writing of the one Roman historian, Tacitus, who does name him. Moreover, that happens to be in a passage that also refers to Jesus in the, uh, the Annals of Rome, uh, Book 15. If an important Roman aristocratic ruler of a major province is not mentioned any more than that in the Greek and Roman writings, what are the chances that a lower class Jewish teacher, which Jesus must have been, as everyone who thinks he lived agrees, would be mentioned in them? Almost none. I might add that our principal source of knowledge about Jewish Palestine in the days of Jesus comes from the, Jewish, uh, from the, from the historian Josephus, a prominent aristocratic Jew who was extremely influential in the social and political affairs of his day. And how often is Josephus mentioned in Greek and Roman sources of his own day, the first century CE? Never. Think of an analogy. If a historian 60 years from now were to write up a history of the American South in, say, the 20th and 21st centuries, is he likely to mention Zlatko Plesha? Zlatko's not here, I hope. <laughs> Zlatko is my brilliant colleague who teaches courses in ancient philosophy, Gnosticism, varieties of early Christianity, and other subjects. Would they mention Zlatko? Almost certainly not. What does that prove? Technically speaking, it proves nothing. But it does suggest either that Zlatko never existed, or that he did not make a huge impact on the political, social, or cultural life of the South. As it turns out, Zlatko does exist. I bought him dinner last night. <laughs> so. If he is not mentioned in a future history of the South, it will no doubt be because he did not make a big impact on the South. To show he existed, one would have to look at other evidence. For example, copies of the two books he has written. Unlike Jesus, Zlocko can write, and in fact, writes very well. And unlike the first century, we have the mass production and distribution of books plus libraries to house them in. So too with Jesus. If he is rarely mentioned, it is barely relevant to the question of his existence it's possible that he simply made too little impact. Just like the overwhelming mass of people who lived in the Roman Empire of the first century. Many Christians do not want to hear that Jesus did not make an enormous splash on the world of his day, but it appears to be true. Does that mean he did not exist? No, it means that to establish his existence we need to look at other kinds of evidence. So for the bulk of the book, I look at the evidence, uh, from the New Testament Gospels especially, and from the writings of the Apostle Paul. And I devote a chapter to two key arguments that pretty much cinch the case that Jesus must have lived, one of which uh, is easy to summarize. The Apostle Paul actually knew Jesus' closest disciple, Peter, as he tells us, and he knew Jesus' bro brother, James. Uh, and as I argue, if Jesus didn't exist, you would think that his brother would know it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and there's actually one other argument that's too complicated to go into that, that cinches it, that Jesus almost certainly existed. I want to uh, just end by reading a page or so on uh, one of the common arguments used by mythicists uh, about Jesus. One of the most widely asserted claims found in the mythicist literature is that Jesus was an invention of the early Christians who had been deeply influenced by the prevalent notion of a dying and rising God as found throughout pagan religions of antiquity. The theory behind this claim is that people in many ancient religions worshipped gods who died and rose again. Osiris, Attis, Tammuz, Heracles, Melkart, Elfmoon, Baal, and so on. Originally, the theory goes, these gods were connected with vegetation and were worshipped in fertility cults. Just as every year the crops die in winter but then come back to life in the spring, so too with the gods who are associated with the crops. They die when the crops do and go to the underworld, but then they revive with the crops and reappear on earth raised from the dead. They are worshipped then as dying, rising deities. Jesus, in this view, was the Jewish version of the pagan fertility deity, 
invented by Jews as a dying and rising God. Only later did some of the devotees of this Jewish deity historicize his existence and begin to claim that he was in fact a divine human who had once lived on earth who had died and then rose again. Once the historicizing process began, it continued rapidly until stories were told about this God-man and eventually a whole set of narratives were invented by authors like Mark, the author of our first gospel. These narratives were not based on real history, however. They were based on myths that had been historicized. This view of the invention of Jesus is nearly ubiquitous among mythicists. There are, however, two major problems with this view that Jesus was originally invented as a dying, rising God modeled on the dying and rising gods of the pagan world. First, there are serious doubts about whether there were, in fact, dying, rising gods in the pagan world, and if there were, whether they were anything at all like the dying, rising Jesus. Uh, and the answer probably is no, there were not gods like that. Uh, second, there is the even more serious problem that Jesus could not have been invented as a dying, rising god because his, earlier fo er, er, because his earliest followers did not think he was God. Uh, I go on and show that. Uh, so uh, I've tried to put something that will offend everybody in this book. So uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>